Okay. So, um, let's see. What we talked about last time that we would talk about is um, the what things could maybe be excluded if you were studying the Barons, like Sneha. And just in general, we have a lot of exclusion statements. But I'll cover the main things. And then we're going to go over some acid-base stuff. Uh, and I want to see if I can show a YouTube video. I found one I like. And uh, I think that we'll talk. I was looking at the first few questions of the retake. And I think a lot of people still struggle with things like buffers. Yes. Uh... Yeah, and talking about the conjugate. So we'll talk about that. Um, so, first thing being first, um, looking at the barons, there actually is not very much you're going to be able to cut out. It's kind of a funny, when looking at, I mean, you could go page by page, but we don't really have time to do that. Rather, just by looking at the table of contents, um, you would, well, let's do this. And I'm sure this will apply to, to any sort of review book if you have that that's before the current information. So you're going to cut out um, exclude. So if you're doing the Barons, it would be chapter 3, nuclear chem. Now, it's not all aspects of nuclear chem because you would still do things like electron configuration, but things like fission and fusion. So no fusion, no fission, no fusion, no quantum numbers. So fission, out. Fusion, out. Radioactive decay, out. Which is interesting because half-lives is not really out because half-lives can be under kinetics. So you still need to know how to do half-lives because of that. So if you have to go into nuclear chem, if you have to go into nuclear chem to study more about half-lives, then you should probably do that. So all those things. Um, I guess isotopes and transmutation. Um, then... Stoichiometry is in, and they say that you don't have to do percent by mass or percent volume, but that doesn't happen very often. You should know how to do it, though. It doesn't make sense to me. So percent composition, for example, is still in. So ignore that part. Uh, if you go down to Chapter 9, and they talk about colligative properties. Those are out. They were kind of hard to understand in the first place, which I just, uh, which is not, it's not like a reason to not study it, but um, they didn't ask very many questions about it. They used to ask a lot about molality, but molality is out. So it's just looking at like pages 332 through 342, something like that. So those are out. Um, and then, if you go to chapter 14, uh, under acids and bases, this is, this is the hard part. Lewis acids and bases are out. And we haven't spent very much time talking about them, which is fine. And an example of a Lewis acid is having like a complex ion. It's called complexation. So here's the funny thing. This is in, even though it's a Lewis acid. I have no idea what they're going to ask about that. That totally confuses me. Um, we're going to talk about it briefly, kind of in review. Um, I probably won't even talk about it tonight, though, just because I think that that's something that I should talk to everybody about briefly. And since there's only going to be a few of you here. But... You should take a look at what complexation is and, and what that means. Um, and I'll tie it, in, tie it in later. So those are the things that is, if you just look at the table of contents that you're excluding. Oh, I forgot. I'm so sorry. Chapter 8. Chapter 8. 
chapter eight, phase diagrams are out, which is just kind of silly, but they are out. Okay, I'm sorry. So those are the things out of the table of contents are out. Now, if you remember things like the Nernst equation or you know doing calculations with that, doing calculations with the Arrhenius equation, doing calculations with the, or doing derivations of the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation is out. But I would say that knowing the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation is important. You should just use it. And, and, and since you can still use it to justify, it's a really quick and easy way, so don't exclude that. The Arrhenius equation, you don't, know how, you don't have to know how to solve with it, but you need to understand the pieces of it. Um, and the Nernst equation, we kind of introduced, and I think it's important to know, but you're not, not going to be required to do calculations. So it's like little things like that that are part of, that really are a part of what we learn um, that have been excluded. So, I don't know, you don't have to memorize the solubility rules, but you do have to know that the alkali metals, ammonium, and nitrates are all soluble. So it's things like that. They kind of took a little bit out of this and a little bit out of that, and then they added things. And of course, then we'll talk later about what they've added in, sort of with like PES, the photoelectron spectroscopy. Also, I'm probably going to I was thinking about doing some other reviews. One review, like all the different types of tests that are, are going to be, that could potentially come in. So the mass spectroscopy, photoelectron spectroscopy, chromatograms or, or chromatography, not chromatograms, chromatography. So some of those things um, I think would be good to talk about in a Google Hangout. I'd also do a Google Hangout on lab procedures. So for example, we're doing spectroscopy with the cuvettes, you know, making sure that you have a blank, make sure that you only press that green button once, um, wipe down the outsides of the cuvette, uh, things like that. And then with like acid-base titrations, make sure that you, you know, rinse out your burette, make sure you avoid the tip, um, you swirl, things like that. Um, uh, go ahead. Uh, for the free response and stuff, mm -hmm. Kind of like our crew response, or will it be some kind of like lab setup kind of things where the students did this lab and they maybe they messed up on this? Like, what what could they do better next time? Is there going to be some like analyzing lab questions too, possibly on crew response? Yes, yes, there could be a lab that says, Hey, you need to run a titration, how would you set that up? Oh, okay, so we really need for the we because I remember you said in class that we do need to know. Um, lab equipment and stuff, is that just to know for the free response or right. is that multiple choice? No, it's mostly for the free response. Okay. And we'll have you on this final, do we need to know lab equipment and stuff? You will for for some of the questions. I don't think for the multiple choice again, but and sometimes it comes up in the multiple choice, but not very often. Usually it's free response. There's usually like one free response question where they they pull that in. So Um, unfortunately, since I haven't, I will say this, unfortunately, since I have not seen their actual exam with their free response questions, it's going to be very difficult for me to make the final exam mimic the AP exam, but I'm going to try to provide some, something, some sort of semblance to that. Mm -hmm. So, okay good. Oh, okay, good. All right. Um, I guess those are all the things as far as the what to cut out, if that helps you at all for your study. Um, let's go ahead and move on to acid bases. Um, and I'll tell you what, I will... Oh, okay, I will, I'm just going to say, I'm gonna, I, I haven't been totally paying attention to my chat, but I will pay attention to the chat right now. So Sneha, what do you think would be the best way to study? The Barons makes it feel a bit overwhelming. Um, what I would say is that, have you taken their diagnostic tests yet? Oh, she's on mute. Yeah, no, that's fine. Not really. Okay, what I would suggest is this. I would suggest taking a diagnostic test and seeing how the results are. And then you could then focus on those areas. What I also like are at the end of each section, um... For example, I just opened the book to the covalent compounds, formulas, and structure. They have practice exercises, and they have some practice free response. Um, I would say that even if you went through each 
I've been focusing on the Kim Olympia stuff. That's good. That's good. Kim Olympia stuff is good. Um, going through, like, as far as the Barons goes, if you were to go through and um, see if you could answer some of the questions and then um, in each section and then go back, like if you struggle with something, you could go back into a section in the Barons and go through it. So it's kind of like a like a backwards seeing how you're doing um, by by taking the tests. So um, I really have liked what I've seen from the Chem Olympiad stuff. It's the same way, like you focus on, okay, I didn't know that, so go back to the Barons and see if you can find the answers and see if that'll give you some, some support. Um, once you've done that a lot, then I would go to the sciencegeek.net and go to Adrian Dingle's pop-up questions and hit those and see how those come out because they've really tried to focus on, on having tests or having their, their quiz questions mimic AP exam questions. So does that sound pretty good, Sneha? Yes, good, okay. Um, now let's go on to, okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about, where did I put the papers? Okay. And do acid bases. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about are what kind of what makes up your acids and you know how strong they are, things like that. Um, so acidity is related to bond strength. Um, if you have like a periodic table that you guys can look at, because some of, I'll be referring to some of the elements, um, and then you can see kind of where they are. Um, so let me just I'll do it in black right now. Okay, so so if we have H two S versus H two SE. And if we look at those two elements, the sulfur is higher up on the table than the SE, okay? So what does that tell you about S versus SE? It's more electronegative. More electronegative, exactly. So if it's more electronegative, what does that mean for its bond with H? It's less, isn't it like, um less willing to dissociate. Right, that's right, because its bond with H2S is stronger. So the HSH right here, this is a stronger bond. Okay, then right here. Okay, so which means that this is a weaker acid. Okay, so, and that happens a lot. If we had to compare um, HCl, HCl, HBr, and HI, which one of those three is the strongest acid? Which one do you guys think it is? I see a periodic table, I don't have one. Oh, hey, I just said go find a periodic table. <laughs> I was going to make it with acid, though. Okay. <laughs> oh, wait, which one's the strongest acid? Or which one's the weakest? No, strongest acid. Oh, HI. Yes. And why is that? Because it is the least electronegative. Great. Okay. So the less electronegative the atom is to the hydrogen, the li more likely it is to dissociate. So it's going to be, um, I'm sorry, let me back up. The more electronegative the atom that's bonded to the H, the stronger that bond, the less likely it is to dissociate. It's a weaker acid. Now, all three of these are strong acids, okay? But HCl is the weakest. And then, of course, there's HF, which I didn't even mention, but that one's a, that's one of my favorites because we, we talk about it for everything. It's not... Like these are all, these three right here are strong acids. Wow, that's not very good writing. 
Okay, these are all strong acids, but this right here is a weak acid. It's sort of like a moderate acid. And so it's still strong enough. It'll, it'll be, it'll etch stuff like glass and bone, but it, it's the weak, it's weaker of these three. It has a, a funky thing because it's so electronegative. Okay, it's very polar. Um, and the more, because it, because the, the HF bond is pretty much covalent, whereas these are all ionic. This is a pretty much covalent bond. Okay. So we need to memorize the, the, there's like seven or something strong acids and strong bases. Yes, you should have those memorized. Okay. So if we were going to, if we were going to say that the strong acids, okay. Ones we just talked about the binary acids. So HCl, oops. HBr, HI, and then the oxy acids, HNO3, H2SO4, and then HClO4. That's the perchloric acid. That one is infrequently used. It's not used very not very often, um, but it is one of our six strong acids. And you might have also noticed that the oxygens are all maxed out on their middle atom, right? We cannot add any more oxygens to the HNO3. Oxy three oxygens is the max. We cannot add any more oxygens to the sulfur. Four is the max. And right here, we cannot add any more oxygens to chlorine. Four is the max. So when you have these oxy acids um, and you have something like, we'll just use chlorine because that's, that's actually a pretty popular one to, to talk about. One... Uh, two is, um, I'm forgetting. Well, that's not very good to try to give us an example and you can't remember the structure. Let me just pull it up real quick. So for structure. That's right. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, we have... Okay, so let's say you have something like this, and you have this hydrogen out to this side right here. Well, these oxygens are pulling, generally speaking, they're pulling the, the electrons away from the H. So even though there's, there's you know, there is some electronegativity around this oxygen, it's pulling on the H because the rest of this is pulling so strongly, it's kind of pulling all the electronegativity in towards this area here which means this H is more likely to come off. But the fewer oxygens we have, so now if we only have, let's say HCl, O, so this is, so if we have HCl, O right here, okay, this chlorine is not pulling nearly strongly. In fact, these, this oxygen and chlorine are actually pretty close to the same electronegativity. And so this hydrogen is not, like it still has some access to the oxygen here because it's not as, as much. And so what's happening is that this H is staying on here. It's a, it's, a, it's a stronger bond between the O and the H right here. So that means that it's gonna be a weak acid whereas this is a strong acid. Okay, so that's in those oxy acids. And that, that comes up periodically there, you know, can you, or how, how strong is the acid? And, they, and that's when they compare oxy acids or they compare binary acids, but they won't compare binary acids against the oxy acid because that's like comparing apples and oranges. Um, what else? They were going to compare... Oh, it, in this same context, since we're talking about these... It makes me think of oxidized, if you're oxidized. And oxidizing is adding oxygens, basically. Oh, boy, they came right out of my, oops. Oh, no. Oh. Having some technical issues on my side. I apologize. At least you're not cutting out again. 
This is very true. And you know what? It, I, I use the same um, Google account too. So maybe it was just my connection. Okay, let's try this again. So if you were oxidized, you add oxygens basically. That's one way of looking at it. So when you're talking about these oxygens, like can HSO3 cannot be oxidized any further? And yes. 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 Oxidized to HSO4. Oh, I just saw Caitlin's question. So Caitlin, are we gonna have to draw stuff like this? You you will you will not have to draw this. No, no draw. Okay, but remember that there are, you will have to draw some Lewis dot structures potentially and know the, the valence shell electron pair theory, right? So um, the Visepper. So if you're doing, and this is not for, not in acid bases, you're not gonna have to draw this. I'll talk about what you might have to draw in a second, but pair, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. And so that would be things like if we gave you, you know, IF3, you have to draw that. And that's a different topic a little bit. Um, that's not the acid base stuff. So you won't, you won't have to draw this for the acid base. They might, they might have you draw something like what's the structure of NH3? Because that's a base. I'm trying to think of something else. Anyways, okay, so that kind of covers that. All right, so oxidized, so they'll have something like that. But then if, you know, can, so yes, go in this direction, but then they would give you ones like, well, ones I've already provided you. HNO3 can't go any further, HCLO4. All right, so while we're talking about, since Caitlin brought up drawings, you will either have to, I can't imagine you having to draw it, honestly. Um, you might have to look at a drawing and say, but you remember when we, we in some of these labs, we've had you do particulate drawings. So, um, you know what? Let's come back to particulate because I think what I'd like to do, I think they would tie that into, I'm just gonna write up here to remind myself particulate drawings. I think they would tie it into titration. And are we to titration yet? I think we can, oh, you know what, I... okay, I'll come back to that later. I want to talk about bases for a second. So bases, so our strong bases, we might as well do that first. If you remember, it was like that Tetris symbol, we'll just call it Tetris, that looks like this. So these three and these three that are tied to an OH. So you're looking at lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, and then you move across from potassium and you do calcium hydroxide and strontium hydroxide and barium hydroxide. And there's a bunch of argument over, you know, what makes something strong or weak in the bases because they just like that kind of stuff. Sometimes magnesium hydroxide is listed as like a moderate to strong and sometimes barium hydroxide is listed as moderate to strong. It's like this, anyway, it doesn't matter. As long as you have those six, let's just go with those six and you should be fine. Um, the weak bases, so with, with acids, it's really easy because you can say, oh, it's Normally it's HNO3, but what if it's HNO2? Oh, it's a weak acid. Like there's a whole bunch of weak acids that they can reference. For bases, oddly enough, there's not a whole bunch of bases to draw upon. So the weak bases are NH3 and anything organic. Why do you know if it's organic again? Okay, so an organic one, let's say you're doing C, let's see, one, two, three. So CH3, NH2. That's an organic acid. Um, that was a, I think it's called methylamine. Which reminds me, we did say, I did say, did I tell you that all the organic stuff is out? I probably forgot to do that about the barons. Huh. Yes, that was, um, 
Oh, I didn't cross it out. I should have. Darn it. So. Right. So, chapter 15, organic. I, I know I didn't cross it out. Okay. So, organic is out. You don't have to know it. But what they're going to do is they're going to throw this stuff out there. And so, it would be nice for you to know what it is, to be able to identify it instead of it being language that you've never seen before. They're gonna give you a picture of it, they're gonna give you the formula, but if you haven't at least looked over the organic information, it's gonna be more difficult to deal with. Um, they're not gonna ask you to have memorized it. See, look, the, here they give this to you. They give you the CH3, NH2, and then they call it methylamine or they say CH3, CH2, NH2, and they call that ethyl amine. So is there anything with CH3 in it? So, no, anything with the NH2, this is what makes it a base right here, the NH2. And so if we looked at it, like the, the, the ethyl amine, you guys remember how much I love drawing this out. Let's just hope I get all the atoms correct this time. Okay, this part right here makes it a base. And what part makes it organic? The part that makes it organic is this part right here. Okay, so it's the, C okay. it's the CHs that make it organic. Technically, anything with a carbon in it is organic. So even like... um. Calcium carbonate, okay? Carbonate right here, this is organic, okay? Even though that's like a, a salt, it has an organic, it, it, you know, it's the same thing with polyatomic ions. If you have, everything looks covalent, but it's got an ion. So it's, chemistry is the science of exceptions. <laughs> but so anything, ca carbon, carbon makes things organic. The only, with, with organic bases, all organic bases are weak. There are no strong organic bases. If it is, if it is, let me go back to the acids. An organic acid, oops. So an organic acid, okay, an organic acid has to end um, with a COOH, or it could end with CH3CO2H. So this is right here is what makes organic acids. And just like organic bases, all organic acids are also weak. So if it's organic, acid or base, it's weak automatically. Okay, now do not be fooled by, see, oh, I did it again. Let's try this again. Okay, do not be fooled by C, uh, H3, C, Oh, we just do C, oh, CH3OH. We'll just do it like that. CH3OH. This right here, if you guys remember, is not a base. What is that? It makes me say an alcohol. Yes, that's right. That's right. It's an alcohol. So that is not a base. And that is something that... Um, that's something that AP loves to throw out there. They're like, oh, which one's the strongest base? And they'll put CH3OH and then CH3NH2 out there, and then they'll put out the NaOH or whatever. And you're going to look at it and say, oh, the CH3OH is, or, or whatever they would do. Just don't be fooled by that. It's an alcohol, not a base. So why is that not a base? Because when that all bonds, it's very um, covalent. It does a C and then the three H's here and then OH. And what would have to happen is that this, if it was going to be a base, this OH would have to come off. But the bond between the carbon and the oxygen is too strong and it does not happen. 
over here with this with this NH3, nothing is coming off, but if you remember, an H is added. So there's this like lone pair of electrons here, and then an H plus comes in and adds it to that, and it becomes CH3CH2 NH3 plus. And that's what happens, when, because a base accepts a proton, Remember, this is the bronsted lowry definition. So it accepts the proton and it becomes the NH3+. So that's why that's based. On this one, there you can add things to the, oh, there's a whole, there's a whole part of organic chemistry where they they add hydrogens on and things like that. And sometimes you can take it off and form water, but it's not producing OH minuses. Like when you, when, or when this comes in, this OH does not come off to produce OH minuses and that's why that's not a base. Okay. So we've talked about strong acids and strong bases and just how they relate. And you guys remember the bronsted lowry definitions of acid bases, bronsted lowry acids, uh, they donate a proton and bronsted lowry bases accept a proton. And that's a big piece of that. So let's talk about conjugates now. Let's spell it correctly too. Conjugates. Okay. So the simple way to approach this would be to say, all right, if I have a strong acid like HCl in water, okay, and it, there's always a little bit of equilibrium, but let's just say it's, we're gonna ignore it for right now. Uh, we know by looking at this that the H being out front is probably the acid if we didn't already have it memorized. And so you're gonna end up producing H3O plus plus Cl minus. And so that, mean, that means that this is the acid and this is the base, okay? And since the H came off of the acid and went to the base, that means that this is the conjugate, okay? And it's the conjugate base, okay? And then this base gained an H, so that makes this the conjugate acid. Now, if I was going to do this with a weak acid, like HC2H3O2 plus H2O, and we would basically get the same thing, but now it's in equilibrium. Oh, my arrows are not looking pretty. Okay, so you get essentially the same thing, essentially the same thing. Now, the reason it's so important that I am now doing this in equilibrium is because if this is the acid base, the whole reason that this is called a conjugate acid and this is called a conjugate base is because if you go the other direction, this being an acid is gonna donate it's extra H to the C2H3O2. And because this accepts the H, this is now a base moving over to the other side, okay? So does that make sense on, on how in equilibrium it goes both ways? And so the, the, like we consider whatever's on the left-hand side, basically, the left-hand side is your acid base. On the right-hand side, we would call them the conjugates. Now, it's pretty easy if you have whatever plus water, but let's say that we don't do it plus water, we do it something else. And so then you start getting situations like, let's do um, the same HC2H3O2 plus NH3, okay? And so now you would get 
and you could you could write them in whatever order you wanted to like oh I'd like to do it like this in the same order HC32 minus plus NH4 plus okay so again acid base conjugate base conjugate acid okay um, and it goes the other direction and um, we know that the H comes back from the, this is ammonium, comes from ammonium to the acetic acid or the acetate. This is the acetate ion. I'm going to give these things some names because this is a polyatomic ion you guys should have memorized. The C2H3O2 minus, that's one of those that you got quizzed on at the very beginning of the year, which means that going back, <laughs> re... And I'm writing this down for all the people that'll be watching this video later. Rememorize polyatomic ions. Because both of these, as a matter of fact, aren't they? Both of these are polyatomic ions you should are supposed to have memorized. And this is ammonium. It has the extra H, and that's why it's got the M at the end. I, I don't know how to, I don't know what the trick is with this. This is just straight ammonia. It has the extra H, that's why I get the extra M. Something along those lines. I think that's how Maddie Lent remembered it. I think she said, I think that she was the one that said, there's an extra M like my name. And that's why it's ammonium. I go, cool. And of course, then this is acetic acid. I'm not gonna name that one. Okay. And now it's really fun when they say H3PO4, let's see, oh. I'm gonna mess this up. They have a super tricky one that they sometimes talk about. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, it would have been so much cooler if I didn't have to look this up. Oh, I should also mention during this commercial break that um, I somehow missed it, or I forgot that the test is only 60 multiple choice questions instead of 75 multiple choice questions. Yay! Yeah. Well, and we're back to the same thing, though. I mean, there's fewer multiple choice questions, so that means for everyone you miss, it's going to count more. Oh. Yeah, you have the same amount of time, and if you have the same amount of time, does that mean that the questions are more difficult? So I, I'll be very interested to see what ends up happening with that. It's, it, say again? That should be good. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. Where was my really cool example? Oh, I'm getting frustrated. Because, oh, maybe it's not that cool. Okay, well, I'll just do it anyhow, and then we'll see. Um, so if we have H3PO4, um, oh, it doesn't, oh, it's not as cool as I thought it was going to be. That's okay. Plus H2O and equilibrium, because it's phosphoric acid, which is a moderate moderate to weak acid, um, gives you H2PO4 minus plus H3O plus. And then sometimes you'll get something like this where it says, they put it on the left and they say, let's do HPO4 two minus plus H2O yields H2PO4 minus plus OH minus. So if you had to compare these two equations, looking at the top equation, which one is your, on the left side, which one is your acid and which one's your base? What? For this top equation. But for the top one, well, the H3PO4 is your acid. Good, so that's your acid and this is your base. 
because on this side, you saw that the H3PO4 gave it up, so that's a conjugate base, and this is a conjugate acid. And then if you come down to the bottom down here, which one's your acid? Switches. They switch. Good. Which, I guess, if you guys are thinkers or test takers at all, you probably could have predicted this just based upon the way I'm asking these questions. But you can see that, that like, because there are so many H's in the phosphoric acid, they like to use this one as the, hey, it's an acid. HPO4- minus could technically be an acid. It's what's called being amphiprotic. It can give up an H or it can gain an H. So like the same thing with H2PO4, it's amphiprotic. It can give up an H or it can gain an H. Okay. So, um, so with that sort of flexibility, you have to pay attention to what happens to the other species to be able to determine which one's the acid and which one's the base. All right. Now, say again. Yes, we're getting there. I was going to, because, because what's the definition of a buffer? Do you guys remember that? Mm 